Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incident. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail, I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. We'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. The jury is hearing about each baby in turn. They've been told 16 babies were allegedly killed or harmed by Lucy Letby between June 2015 and June 2016. Today we'll hear that a doctor who re-examined medical and post-mortem records told the court how he concluded six of the babies died. Welcome to episode 26, Unnatural Causes So, this week we are without Liz, but I'm going to be ably assisted by Kim Pilling. Now, we've heard from Kim before on the podcast because he's the reporter from the Press Association who's covering this case. Kim's been in Court 7 at Manchester Crown Court every day and he's filing stories for all media organisations. So if you're following this case closely on the news or in the press, there's a really good chance you're reading what Kim is writing. So, Kim, thanks for stepping in to Liz's shoes. Well, it's it's a brave new world for me, Caroline, but uh, I'm, I'm ready, willing and able, or hopefully able. All right, so let's get into what's been happening in court. The last few days have been focused on an expert pathologist who was asked to review medical and post-mortem evidence from some of the babies in the case. Yes, so this evidence was given by Dr Andreas Marnaridis and he's a consultant paediatric pathologist based at St Thomas's Hospital in London and that's one of the biggest uh, main teaching hospitals in the country. And he was in the witness box for two days answering questions from... Prosecutor Nick Johnson, KC, and uh, the defence representing Lucy Letby, that was Ben Myers. So Dr Marnarida's evidence has been focused on baby A, baby C, baby D, baby E, baby I, and baby O, and baby P. That's because these were the babies who were allegedly murdered by Lucy Letby. And you remember from the last couple of weeks on the podcast, we talked about babies O and P. They were two of three triplets who died within 24 hours of each other in June 2016. Yeah, the prosecution say Lucy Letby attacked baby O on her first shift back after returning from a holiday to Ibiza. And then they say that she went on to attack his brother on the following day shift. 
So we'll explain what Dr. Manorita said about each of the babies he reviewed, but we're going to start with baby O and baby P because it was during his evidence about them that he said not only had both boys been injected with air, but they'd also sustained bruises to their livers. And the doctor described what he called huge areas of bruising on baby O's liver, the like of which he might expect to see in children involved in road traffic accidents or non-accidental assaults. Yes, the court was shown post-mortem examination photographs of baby O, which showed two separate sites of bruising as well as a blood clot. And the doctor was questioned by Mr Johnson about possible causes of the injury and whether the CPR performed by the doctors to try to save him when he collapsed could have caused it. Now their exchange has been voiced by actors and begins with Mr Johnson. How does that injury come to be in a child of child O's age? So the distribution, the pattern and the appearance of the bruising indicates towards impact type injury. I'm fairly confident this is impact type injury. Looking at this sequence of photographs, can you rule out the possibility that these injuries were caused by CPR? I cannot convince myself that in the setting of a neonatal unit, this would be a reasonable proposition to explain this. I don't think CPR can produce this extensive injury to a liver. So I've seen this extensive hemorrhaging in two types of children, in a road traffic collision, in accidents with bicycles. And I've seen it in babies in the context of cases, not in the neonatal care unit where they've suffered non-accidental type injuries. Child assaults by parents or carers? Yes. Mr Johnson also asked about why such traumatic internal bruising may not be visible on the skin. In so far as you have spoken about an impact type scenario for causing that internal injury, would you necessarily expect to see any outside sight on the skin itself? You can have the most devastating injury internally and nothing can be observed externally. That is very common. What, in your view, was the cause of death of child O? In my view, the cause of death was inflicted traumatic injury to the liver, profound gastric and intestinal distension following acute excessive injection, infusion of air via a nasogastric tube and air embolism due to administration into a venous line. And Kim, this emphasis on whether these injuries to baby O and baby P's livers could have been caused by CPR attempts was also explored by Ben Myers, Casey, Lucy Letby's barrister. Now, Dr. Manorides conceded that the bruises on baby P were smaller than those on baby O, so could have been the result of CPR. But he was adamant this was not the case for baby O. Dr. Manorides was cross-examined by Mr. Myers at length about this, their exchange focuses on the large bruise on baby O's liver. It's been voiced by actors and begins with Mr Myers. Can you assist with how little force could be involved? I think there is no way of measuring a force in a baby because we don't conduct such experiments on babies. I've never seen this type of injury in the context of CPR, so I would say the force required would be of the magnitude of that generated by a baby jumping on a trampoline and falling. This is a huge area of bruising for a liver of this size. This is not something you see in CPR. So you don't accept the proposition that forceful CPR could cause this injury in general terms? Do you agree it cannot be categorically excluded as a possibility? We're not discussing possibilities here. We are discussing probabilities. When you refer to possibilities, I'm thinking, for example, of somebody walking in the middle of the Sahara Desert found dead with a pot and head trauma. It is possible the pot fell from the air from a helicopter. The question is, is it probable? And I don't think we can say it is probable. So Dr Monorides was also asked about the other babies who died and the court was told that he was sent hundreds of pages of medical evidence as well as tissue slides and photographs to review. In every case but one, he said, there was evidence that air had been injected into the babies, either via their feeding tubes or into their tummies. So let's start with baby A, who we talked about in the podcast back in episode three. Baby A was a baby boy, born at just over 31 weeks by caesarean section in June 2015, weighing 1.6 kilos. Now, he needed help with his breathing initially, but he was said to be stable. He collapsed and died the following day and a post-mortem was carried out. At the time, the cause of his death was deemed to be unascertained, but Dr Manorida said he made an unusual finding of air in some of the veins in the lungs of baby A. He also found a similar thing in baby A's brain. 
And the doctor told the court that after taking all the medical reports into account, as well as his findings of air, he said he took the view that death was explicable on the basis of air embolism, because air had been injected into baby A's bloodstream. Baby C was the next case the doctor examined. And just to take you back to episode five of the podcast, baby C was tiny. He weighed less than two pounds when he was born by cesarean section 10 weeks early in June 2015. The nurse looking after baby C described him as the smallest baby she'd ever seen. There'd been problems with his mother's pregnancy, which meant blood flow to the placenta was abnormal. And this had restricted his growth in the womb. So he was only half the size he should have been for his gestation. So he was delivered early at 30 weeks. He was immediately placed in nursery one, the intensive care room. But even from birth, he was described by the nurse looking after him as a feisty little baby because he was active, wriggling around and pulling out his tubes. So doctors started reducing his breathing support so they could start feeding him. But on the evening of June 13th, 2015, he suddenly collapsed and he died. A post-mortem carried out at the time concluded that baby C died from pneumonia. And in fact, when Dr. Marnarides initially reviewed the case in 2019, he agreed with this. But later, he changed his mind after reading more medical reports. Yes, he told the court that baby C did have pneumonia, but he was stable and responding to treatment, and his collapse was therefore unexpected. He also said baby C's tummy had ballooned. He concluded that baby C died as a result of having an excessive quantity of air injected into his stomach, and that air had led him to being unable to breathe and suffering a cardiac arrest. His final view was that baby C died with pneumonia, not from pneumonia. Now, baby D's records were also re-examined by Dr Marnarides. She was a baby girl and we outlined her case in episode 6. She's the only baby in this case who was not born prematurely. She actually weighed 6 pounds 14 ounces when she was born. And the courts heard that she was only at the Countess of Chester because the hospital made a mistake by not giving her mother antibiotics when her waters broke, which meant the baby was born with a suspected infection. She was responding to treatment initially and appeared to be stable, but overnight on June 22nd, 2015, she collapsed three times and she died at 5am. Now the prosecution say Lucy Letby murdered her. The initial postmortem found her cause of death to be pneumonia, but Dr Marnarides told the jury that the presence of air around the tip of a catheter indicated what he called the intentional injection of air into her bloodstream. So baby E was the fifth alleged victim of Lucy Letby and we outlined his case back in episode 7. He was a baby boy. He and his identical twin brother were born 10 weeks early in August 2015. Now baby E weighed just under three pounds when he was born, a minute before his brother, and he was considered to be the stronger of the two babies. Both boys were doing well and about to be moved to a hospital closer to their parents' home. But before this could happen, the court was told, Lucy Letby murdered him. The allegation is that she shoved a tube or medical instrument down his throat, causing an internal bleed before injecting him with air. Now at the time, the doctor treating baby E didn't think a post-mortem was necessary and she didn't push for one. And you might remember that in court, during the examination of the evidence in baby E's case, the doctor turned to the parents in the public gallery and apologised to them for this. And of course, with no autopsy, Dr. Marnarides could not review baby E's case. So the final baby Dr. Marnarides gave evidence about was baby I. She was a very premature baby girl, born at 27 weeks when her mother's waters broke 13 weeks early. Baby I's mother went to the Countess, but she was later transferred to Liverpool Women's Hospital, which is more specialist at caring for very early babies. And her daughter was born naturally a few days later, at the beginning of August 2015. But she was tiny. She weighed just two pounds and two ounces, which is about the same as a bag of sugar. And doctors warned her parents that she would be in hospital for a while. But despite her size, baby I did well. And when she was around six weeks, the doctors at Liverpool Women's Hospital decided she could be transferred to the Countess to be closer to her parents' home. But the prosecution say that once there, over the course of three weeks, Lucy Letby attacked her on three separate occasions, either by overfeeding her milk injecting air into her stomach or into her bloodstream. She finally succeeded, said the Crown, in murdering her on the fourth attempt on October the 23rd. 
A post-mortem examination was carried out and her cause of death was recorded as being due to prematurity, which caused damage of the brain and lung. But Dr. Manarides said his examinations of the record showed that her bowel was expanded like a partially inflated balloon. Dr. Manarides concluded that the consolation of findings would strongly indicate that baby eye died due to unnatural causes, having been injected with air into her stomach and intestines. Now, Lucy Letby denies harming any of the babies in this case, and we heard that Mr Myers, her KC, challenged Dr Manarides on the liver bruises on baby O and baby P, and whether they could have been caused by CPR. But what did he say about the other babies, Kim? Mr Myers made the point that the pathologist was basing his views about how the babies died, not only on his review of the post-mortem evidence, but also on the views of prosecution expert witnesses Sandy Bowen and Dowie Evans, and also radiology experts Professor Owen Arthurs. Mr Myers also pointed out that in the case of Baby C, the pathologist had changed his mind about the cause of death. Delighted now to be able to bring you an interview which Liz and I did last week with Carol Watson. For many years, Carol was a national news and feature writer, covering everything from the Brit Awards to the death of Michael Jackson. She's now an academic at Sunderland University, where she specialises in media law. She started by giving us a potted history about her career. So I always wanted to be a journalist since I was a little girl. My dad was a journalist on a national newspaper, so I was brought up surrounded by ink and newspapers. I went to study journalism when I was 18, and my first job was as a court reporter at York Crown Court, brilliant old building with a ghost, apparently. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. You know, the privilege of being the eyes and ears of the public, but also it did often feel like I was watching soap operas all day and all forms of life were there. I worked a lot in hard news and court reporting on newspapers for several years before moving more into features. I work at the University of Sunderland now, back in my native northeast, where I do teach media law. I love teaching it because it's so important for students to be safe and ethical and to make sure that whatever they produce and publish is safe and doesn't harm anyone. But at the same time, I can talk about really interesting cases that are coming up. So, you know, when we have something like Johnny Depp suing a newspaper for libel, I can quickly change my lecture and have lots of pictures of Johnny Depp there and talk about him. We have had some cracking ones, though, haven't we, with Johnny Depp and then Wagatha and the Roonies. <laughs> We've had some good celebrity ones recently. You said before we came on air that I said, how do you get them engaged? And you said, because I tell them they'll go to prison if they do it wrong. Is it hard to make them realise that actually journalism comes with lots and lots of caveats? I don't think they realised at all before they join us on day one that there are any restrictions on the press. I think they just assume you can go where you want, do what you want, write what you want. So probably at first I absolutely terrify them when I explain that certain things can make you be fined, have thousands of pounds damages against you. And even certain laws, you could end up in jail if you publish something you shouldn't. But I think the whole point is to teach them this but then say, but I'm also going to teach you how you can work within those laws, but still do great, important journalism at the same time, because there's no point just terrifying would-be journalists into saying, oh, well, I won't do any difficult, tricky stories anymore, because then we wouldn't know about Partygate, right? It's such a good point, Carol, about knowing the law well enough to work within it safely, isn't it? Because the law shouldn't mean journalists shy away from covering those tricky stories. I mean, this podcast is legally difficult. You know, we're covering an ongoing trial, so that in itself has to be done really carefully. But in addition to that, this trial has got lots of anonymity orders. So we've got to be really careful not to name anyone whose identity is protected. I was talking to a student yesterday who was asking me about how difficult it is to abide by those anonymity and while I'm reporting the case. And He didn't realise, which I hadn't really thought that maybe the public don't realise, that in the courtroom, obviously the names of these babies, the names of the doctors, the names of the parents are all being used. And it's up to the journalist to make sure that I call them baby A, baby B. They're not being called baby A, baby B in the courtroom. 
And I think what my students don't realise, and maybe the public don't realise, is that whatever they read in a newspaper or hear on your podcast is probably a very small amount of what the reporters heard in court and been able to write in their notebook. And then that reporter is legally trained to know, well, I can't publish this name or I can't publish this bit of information. Your podcast makes it very clear at the start every week. We're not going to say anything that the jury haven't heard because you cannot step without those boundaries. The jury have to decide on their verdict based on what they hear in court. And people on Twitter who don't know the law or different social media will comment on all sorts of cases. But you found a really interesting way of covering it while being completely legally safe. We've had a few comments, haven't we, about you're not saying much about what she says, but we have said a couple of times that we're still on the prosecution evidence. So they're probably going to finish their case in a few weeks time. And then Lucy Letby's defence will start, you know, then that's her barrister's time to, to say why she says she's not responsible for what happened. So we are building up to that. I think it's very difficult for people to understand who haven't studied laws about contempt of court that, you know, you should not be commenting on what you think about a case and whether someone is guilty or not or looks guilty or not. Do we really want to be like America that doesn't have these laws where there are trials and all sorts of people going on TV commenting on it? Just finally, to to wrap up, favourite stories that you've worked on? Oh, so many. I went to the Brits a lot. I went to Pride of Brit a lot. I drank a lot of champagne. But I've also did some stories that I'm really proud of as well. An example of working without stopping was uh, when I was on the Daily Mirror, I was head of features. And I think I got a call at about midnight to say Michael Jackson had died. And I went into the office and we didn't go home for three days because it was just such a massive story that we had endless pages of the paper to fill. We made extra magazines on top. More serious stuff I'm proud of. We had a story at the Daily Mirror. One of my colleagues got the story, actually, that a little girl in Hull was so desperately in need of a new heart. She was at the top of the organ transplant waiting list around Europe. And we started a campaign on the Mirror to get a million more people to sign up as donors. And we did. And that makes me kind of proud. Carol, thank you so much for talking to us. Take care. So that's it for episode 26. The jury is now hearing about the final baby in this case, baby Q. Uh, The prosecution say he survived an attack by Lucy Letby in June 2016 on the day after the death of baby P and two days after the death of baby O. And it's after this alleged attack on baby Q that Lucy Letby was removed from the ward. Now, she denies harming any of the babies in this case. Kim, thank you for standing in so ably. Glad to say you'll be back again next week while Liz is still away. Yep, I'll be back. And in the meantime, I'll be in court as usual to cover the case. You can still read reports on the case in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. See you next week.